it's Monday, and that so happens to be the day that I like to talk about monsters. Hello, everybody. I am Jeff Arbuckle, and this is Monster Mondays, presented to you by Film Seizure. Uh, so come with me under the sea for this week's episode, and if you want to imagine me as a little, little lobster guy singing under the sea, I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to do it for you, but I'm not going to stop you. Uh, we're going to talk about The Giant Behemoth, and this was a uh, 1959 film. Uh, it was directed by uh, French director Eugene Laurie. Now, there are accents in his name, and I'm not entirely sure how that plays into the pronunciation of his name. But, uh, in my dumb American accent, I'll just call him Eugene Laurie. <laughs> um, this is a little bit of a follow-up, in sorts, to his 1953 film, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Now, that movie, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, is an extremely popular and influential movie. Uh, first and foremost, it was early work for um, uh, for Ray Harryhausen, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. But uh, it was made on a $200,000 budget, grossed around $5 million, which is quite a bit for a monster movie in the early 50s. And uh, I know I've been guilty of this in the past where I've said things like, you know, how extremely uh, influential the first Godzilla movie was that came out in 1954. Well, to be honest with you, it might have taken influence from the beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Um, it, it was just that popular of a movie. Now, uh, like I said, Ray Harryhausen, um, did the uh, did the effects, the creature effects for uh, the Beast from Twenty Thousand Fathoms? Of course, he's a Willis O'Brien protege, uh, but really, that that was the beginning of Ray Harryhausen's um, dominance over stop motion creatures like that. Uh, and speaking of Willis O'Brien, uh, he would go on to do the Giant Behemoth in nineteen fifty nine. Now. Um, of course, Willis O'Brien, we've talked about him before. He was the guy who created King Kong. Um, he is incredibly influential in his own right. Um, he had an effects studio uh, in Los Angeles, so all of his stuff with the creature and everything was done in Los Angeles, while the narrative story was shot entirely in Great Britain. Um, the effects were then merged with the rest of the film using basically optical trickery of the time to uh, overlay the stop motion animation stuff uh, into the live action uh, scenes. Now, while still considered to be pretty good effects work, and I do have something to say about that uh, when we get to my three likes at the end of this episode, um, it's often stated that you can really kind of see that this is a considerably lower budget than what Willis O'Brien typically would work with, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. There are two primary stars of this movie, The Giant Behemoth. Uh, the first is uh, American actor Gene Evans. Now, he was a longtime character actor. He did tons and tons of movie and TV shows from the 50s into the late 80s. He might have even done a couple of TV shows after his final film role in 1989. Um, he uh, just, he was... Uh, kind of just the, this kind of character actor type of of actor right he he could professionally show up get the job done and uh and, and really kind of look pretty good in it the, in fact uh the two stars of this movie i have even more to say later but uh he but evans did a lot of genre work with westerns noir war films the popular stuff that was around in the 50s and 60s in particular uh, most of his tv work was done in westerns so that's not uncommon uh for a lot of american character actors to eventually find themselves in a lot of those western tv shows and sure enough that that's the case with uh, gene evans now our other uh lead star I should say that Evans also is the is kind of the main hero of the movie, um, but our other main star who kind of acts as a important ally in the early stages of this movie, but also um, 
kind of comes across as a mentor of sorts is uh, played by British actor Andre Morel. Um, he acted in two Best Picture Oscar winners, uh, Bridge Over the River Kwai and Ben-Hur. And speaking of Ben-Hur, in 1959, Morel was in Ben-Hur, of course, this movie, The Giant Behemoth. And then he also played Dr. Watson in uh, Hammer's uh, in Hammer Films, the Hound of the Baskervilles, and he was opposite of Peter Cushing for that. Uh, so he had a pretty, uh, a pretty good 1959, really. He ended up doing several more of the Hammer horror films in his later career, being in uh, Plague of the Zombies, I think was one of them, um, one of the Mummy sequels. So, you know, he was just another one of those longtime character actors. And in fact, pretty much everyone in this movie had that quote-unquote character actor label, and that's probably due to cost. You need to have a handful of people show up and say a few lines uh, that weren't either Evans or Morell, uh, who had the lion's share of all the lines. But, you know, you just go out and you find people who could professionally get the job done, who wasn't going to be asking for a star's uh, um, wage or anything like that. And you can make a pretty effective and good movie just with a, with a load of character actors. And a lot of these monster movies in the 50s did that, in fact. So, interestingly, before we get into this movie, and I can... Uh, talk to a little bit I can speak a little bit to why I think this is but surprisingly there are several versions of this movie the version of this movie that I saw is nearly 80 minutes however when it was originally completed and then handed over to censors in the US and Great Britain and so forth uh, it was a 71 minute movie in Britain when they uh, gave it over to the censors they originally received an X certification, meaning adults only, like X. You know, it's an X-rated movie. You know, we had those in the in the United States, particularly in the 60s, uh, 60s and 70s. So uh, they ended up having to go back and shaving off two more minutes. And so the 69, like 69 minute, um, 10 second movie or something like that, uh, ended up being what was able to be released to. Uh, British theaters. I find that kind of interesting because I think I know why it gets that adults only rating uh, since I looked at a, a completely untouched version of the movie, but uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that here uh, towards the end of the episode. But uh, the movie opens with, uh, you know, it, much like a lot of those sci-fi monster movies of the 50s where it was talking about the damage that humans kind of bring and wreak upon the world and everything. It opens with this biblical statement about the Lord delivering a behemoth to, uh, I think, to kind of pay for human sins. But um, then we get a, a lot of stock footage of nuclear explosions, and that's when we meet uh, Evans' uh, character, who is Steve Carnes. And he's speaking to a bunch of British scientists about the dangers of nuclear explosions and the effects that it could have on sea life. We already know what effects it has on land, and that's why a lot of these tests are done out in the middle of nowhere. But he's there to talk about the, the dangers that it poses to the sea life. Um, he's concerned that all this radiation will ultimately create something that will kind of strike back at humanity. Um, and sure enough, a fisherman in Cornwall, uh, Cornwall is witness to what he reveals in his dying breath, which is a behemoth. Um, and the supposed monster, is, you know, he says it basically is bright. It, it looks like it's on fire. Um, and, uh, you know, it kind of leaves its witnesses all burned up with radiation uh, burns and so forth. Also, fish start to show up on the shore dead. And they are, too, uh, we find out later, irradiated. But um, we also discover that there are little deposits of nuclear waste that's left on the shore uh, as well in these little kind of deposits. Um, but Carnes and... Um, Morell's professor James Bickford um, go uh, investigating and Carnes truly believes that something came out of the sea to cause these problems and when he's um, examining some fish uh, the scientist that he's working with discovers some some glowing gunk 
from one of the fish. And suddenly, they realize that some of the specimens that they've collected are ridiculously irradiated. So Carnes goes to where that fish that he found the, the gunk in is most common, uh, where it's found most commonly. And uh, as the Geiger counter goes nuts, he sees what appears to be either a big tail or a big neck. Now, the creature, after they see this and they try to get a bead on it and try to follow it, it begins to move away too fast for the boat that he's on to really follow. Now, not just fish show up, you know, beached and so forth, but now an entire ship is now showing up on the, on the shores as well. And uh, this basically scrambles the Navy and the Coast Guard to try to figure out what's going on. And, of course, Carnes realizes that uh, the, the condition of the ship and the, and the radiation left behind is very, very uh, concerning to him. Uh, but then um, the, the behemoth then is seen attacking uh, the shoreline and kills a villager, his son, and their dog. And this time, they, uh, the people who are investigating it get a picture of a footprint. So they go and meet with a paleontologist. And this is uh, Evans and Morell's characters go to meet with this paleontologist who is really, really excited to hear this evidence. And um, it appears to be what he calls a paleosaurus, which also carries an electrical charge, which is made worse by this present day creature's radiation. Uh, and by the way, the paleontologist is played by uh, Jack McGowan, who uh, is really best known as the drunken film director Burke in The Exorcist. It's kind of neat to see him um, kind of play this type of uh, character where he's very uh, wide-eyed and very um, fascinated and hopeful and excited to, to find out about this fish that they uh, or that this dinosaur that may still be living. Um, the uh, paleontologist uh, is then sent up on a helicopter with some of the uh, Coast Guard to um, check out and see if they can find the creature in the, in the sea. And so they, he sees a shape in the water uh, from above in the helicopter, but the creature lets off some of its radiation and it, and it essentially blows up the helicopter, killing everybody on there. But then uh, the behemoth, uh, which is something that the paleontologists uh, suggest it may be doing, which is trying to get to shallower water where it was born. Uh, but uh, he, uh, the behemoth ends up surfacing in shallower waters closer to uh, Britain or to uh, London, I should say. And um, it's, it makes itself seen to a fairy uh, full of people uh, before it ends up capsizing the ferry, leaving a bunch of people in the water, and of course they get burned by radiation, and and uh, some people drown. It's it pretty much kills everybody on the ferry. Um, the military at this point now prepares for the behemoth to essentially come to land. It's it's pretty obvious now it is going to make landfall in London. Uh, and the army wants to blow it up, but uh, Bickford and Carnes advise against that because if you blow up a creature that's irradiated, now what you're doing is you're spreading all of its irradiated pieces of its body pretty much everywhere in town it would it could potentially make uh london in, inhabitable is what uh, bigford kind of argues uh, so they decide that a torpedo underwater uh would be a little bit better and because the uh because of the radiation of the creature they realize that the creature is burning itself out so they figure well let's let's lace the tip of the torpedo with some radium and we'll shoot it into the skin of the creature and it will accelerate him burning itself out basically going into meltdown and if they do it in water it will uh, basically uh, be able to better disperse that uh, that radiation is what is is basically now i'm no scientist obviously but they i believe that's what they the the point is of making sure they they torpedo it underwater and not attack it above land um so um 
the creature then comes out of the uh, the River Thames and uh, and really kind of starts on its rampage. So the radium t- torpedo is made ready, and uh, you know. Uh, Carnes gets into a submarine and begins to to hunt the the creature. And they find the beast and they hit it with the torpedo, effectively killing it pretty quickly thereafter. Uh, Everybody thinks everything's going to be okay, but unfortunately, reports coming from America says that there's a whole bunch of dead fish showing, showing up along the Atlantic coastline of the country. And it uh, looks like the problem will just start all over again. So let's get to my three things that I like about this movie. Every episode I talk about three things I like, even if the movie's not particularly great. But I actually quite like this movie quite a bit. I know that it doesn't get the greatest of reviews because um, I think a lot of people don't appreciate giant monster movies that take place in England because... <laughs> British people tend to try to keep that stiff upper lip, Uh, but I think this movie is quite effective in a lot of ways. And the first uh, like that I have shows off how effective this movie is, and that is how they kind of do the investigation work and all of the build-up to the monster revealing itself. Um, This movie is um, really good at first having your main character talk about hey i think there's a real problem with radiation getting into the water and how much radiation shows up in the fish that then show up in the birds that then show up in and how it could lead to basically affecting all of us because either the birds are carrying it or we're eating the fish all of it is is not good so there is something there to question and something there to be concerned about well when people start showing up with radiation burns of course that that begins the the process of well something is obviously killing this fi- these fish something seemingly is coming out of the water and it is irradiating people and burning them to death and so they do a really good job at really kind of going in and step by step trying to figure out and uh you know a term that we've all gotten used to in 2020 which is they follow the science they try to figure out and yes some of it sounds incredibly unlikely or stupid or or makes the the scientists sound crazy but damn it if it doesn't end up being the case they you know there is a giant monster that is coming out of the sea and it is burning people by letting off all of this radiation so it's it's really good at that and they also do a really good job of making all of that investigation all of that build up the attacks that happened before you really get to the conclusion it's a pretty dark movie and i really do think that that is something that that led to that x certificate that they got from the british censors um in that scene in which people are uh that ferry gets capsized um you see people drowning um now obviously the the people playing the the parts the extras they're not drowning but they're but they're sinking under the water as they're waving for help um you see people who get burned um and they were helpless and on top of that it is uh basically confirmed that multiple children die in this movie um on that ferry there was this sweet little girl with her little dolly and she's there with her mother well after the boat gets capsized you start seeing that people are dying from both drowning and from the radiation uh her dolly comes you know surfaces back at the top of the water to indicate yeah that little girl died um there's also a little boy who dies in this movie when when the villagers uh get attacked um in the the one of the uh, attack scenes before they figure out that it's a creature uh you know you see the kid get burned to a crisp so you know i mean this movie is surprisingly willing to basically show some really really dark stuff um and it really kind of helps build that tension that man this thing is almost unbeatable and unstoppable you either have to try to find a way to kill it now or we're gonna have to accept our losses while it dies out and and it really kind of creates this really interesting uh, story and this really interesting build up to the big climax Second, uh, I really like uh, 
Gene Evans and Andre Morel in this. I, they seem very, very um, typical 50s scientist heroes, but at the same time, they are not macho science people. They are just the experts in the room. Uh, Morel plays the older head of a of a society of scientists that that uh, you know Evans was talking to at the beginning of the movie, uh, and they treat each other first as as colleagues and as peers, but you also see that Evans looks to Morel as kind of a of a um, a mentor type and it's a really good relationship the two characters have and it does not fall into like i said those trappings of the 50s macho scientists these are just the guys who know what to do um and they're able to state their their claims succinctly and to the point and they can get the help they need uh because again people are looking to the scientists to say oh my god what do we do with a dinosaur that's irradiated on top of that Um, but you can tell that they are very very good actors and you can tell that they really i think liked working with each other because they every scene that they have together is those are some of the best scenes of the entire movie and i really appreciate that because again it's i i've made jokes about this in past giant monster sci-fi movies that i've covered here but you get those macho scientist heroes which were all the craze of these types of movies in the 50s and they come off as kind of assholes while these two guys come off as being legitimate like scholars and legitimate like they know what they're talking about and they can get what they need without coming off as being pushy or demanding or anything like that like some of those more macho uh, characters were like Um, and then third yes even though this movie was operating on a budget all of the effects shots i think are really pretty effective um there are scenes in which you have the stop motion creature uh interacting with models and with uh you know like the the particularly the fairy scene and i think it does a really good job of of intermixing these ideas and still making it look relatively real for the limited budget that they had um and it's a it's a real testament to people like uh o'brien or harryhausen who um know how to make a stop motion creature move and look and make you feel like it's got the weight behind it um it's the one thing that was always why i always liked the idea of a guy in a rubber suit to play Godzilla in the old movies, you see the weight of that because the miniatures can be built to that scale and you can actually see somebody with weight stepping on it. Well, O'Brien's very good at that too, even with stop motion animation. And he does a really good job in in this too. And I really like how, and this kind of goes back to uh, my first like with the buildup and everything, uh, when when the creature first attacks the old fisherman at the beginning of the movie, it, it you don't see the creature, but you see the effects of the creature letting off its radiation. It almost comes across as almost being an alien type of, of creature or an alien that attacks the old man. Um, and again, I think it does that really well to show... You know, when we have when they say that this thing's electrically charged like an eel, you can see an eel glow when it's letting off its its uh, electrical discharge, right? Well, in this, they have to not only show that it's letting off its discharge, but that it's also radioactive, and they do a really good job of having kind of like um, this kind of like I guess it's kind of like a spiral effect uh, as it's kind of radiating off. And, uh, and it's all part, it just all leads up to it. Just a, a fun little monster movie with some interesting ideas and interesting things. And I know that uh, one of the main criticisms of this movie is that it does uh, maybe follow a little too closely with The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms um, and almost coming across as a rewrite of that movie. But I don't really care. I think this movie still does a really good job at doing the science seeing the people figure out what this thing is and for them not to be taken as cranks but then they say well yeah i mean you're showing us the evidence it's all lining up it just makes for a really really good movie all right 
So that wraps up this week's Monster Mondays. Don't forget to check out new episodes of Film Seizure every Wednesday and a new installment of Monster Mondays each Monday on FilmSeizure.com as well as places where fine podcasts are found like SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify. Uh, we've actually just recently uh, been able to get onto Amazon where you can go through Audible and without a subscription you can listen to the podcast uh, through that as well. Um, additionally, hop on over to Facebook and Twitter. Follow us by just searching for Film Seizure. And while you're at it, head over to www.bmovieenema.com and read uh, new text articles each and every Friday. And uh, if you want to watch a movie, well, there's now an episodic B-Movie Enema, the series, on YouTube. Uh, new episodes will be coming out every Saturday from January 2nd to March 27th, 2021. Um, and you can catch a full movie with me on YouTube by searching for B-Movie Enema uh, or on the B-Movie Enema website. Uh, if you go over to uh, YouTube, just search for B-Movie Enema and uh, you can subscribe to the page there. But until next week, stay spooky.